in Revelation 22 and verses 1 through 11 this week, called this message, Heaven, Your New Home. Heaven, Your New Home. We have some real estate agents in our church and, and <laughs> free advertising. Realtors have open houses to give people a sneak preview of what it would be like to live there. At least that's one of the reasons that they do it. And so everybody can check it out. And you guys have done these kind of things. It's the difference between driving past the house that has a for sale sign out front and maybe reading about it on the website listing versus going in and spending time looking around. You know, you get way more excited about it if you can get inside. You can picture yourself living there, can't you, when you do stuff like that. Well, that's what we're going to do today here. (laughs) What God does is he kind of pulls back the curtain and gives you a peek into your new home. That is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to get a sneak peek into your new home. I think we all want a place that we can call home. That's why there's this phrase that we have in our culture, home sweet home. It's like we want this sweet retreat that we can go to at the end of the day and enjoy that. And I've got one of those, and I know that many of you do. And if you don't, you probably want one. But there's a place that God has prepared for you that's much better than that. It's eternal. You never have to fix anything. (laughs) Joy is always there. Peace, the glory of God. And so we're in the part of the Bible that describes all of that. And it's been great. Last chapter and now this one. Actually, in these verses I'm going to cover, John, what he does by revealing this to us is that answers three big questions about heaven, about our new home. And so we're going to take you to through those in these 11 verses. So one at a time in our outline. And then at the end, there's actually a caution that needs to be talked about. So answering to these three big questions and then a caution. And that's particularly for you if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ yet. And so I want to invite you to know him and to show you that God is very serious about this matter. And there's only one way to eternal life. So with that, starting here in verse 1, the first big question that we're going to get answered for us here is what do we find there? Okay, number one, what do we find there? And here, I'm going to start reading in verse 1, and this is what John the Apostle said. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God, and of the lamb. Okay, so just a little background. The last time, if you missed this, in chapter 21, John was giving us a, a description basically of the outside of the city. You know, he described this place that, that the Bible calls the New Jerusalem. It's, it's what we think of as heaven, right? This city that we will all dwell in. It's huge. We learned last time that it's 1,500 mile cube length width height 1500 miles so it's about two-thirds three-fourths the size of the united states it's a gigantic city and it's nothing like you've ever seen before it's the most beautiful place there's no crime there and we live just free with the lord god's glory we're told previously will light the city and so that means there's no need for the sun to shine in that place. God lights it in his glory. The the gates there are made of a single pearl, these 12 gates around the city. It's a rainbow of colors and golden streets, and no evil will ever enter it. Sounds great, doesn't it? Are you ready? Let's go. (laughs) You're like, well, maybe not today. (laughs) So that's all kind of the outside. Then he, he brings us inside here. And as I said, there's three big questions. The first answer to question one, which was, what do we find there? And that is, God has a throne. We just read that, right? In verse one. Because it's his place, too. Like you could say, it's his place primarily. (laughs) And so God has a throne there. Notice that we're told that God's throne is there, and so is the lamb. And who's the lamb? Do we know who the lamb is? 
Jesus Christ, right? He, John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how we know him. Previously, if you're back in chapter 5 when we were doing that, John said, Jesus the Lamb appears as he was slain. So it seems like when we see him there, that we'll see his wounds too. It will appear just as he was crucified. And God's throne... John, that's what he sees, gets his attention, right? God has a throne there. That's one thing that we find there. The second answer to question one is there's a river of life there, right? He just told us that in verse one, river of life. And it comes from God's throne. Now, do you guys think that this is a literal river there? You think it is? I think it is. He's pretty specific, you know. It's one thing... (laughs) To hear things that are symbolic that are sort of vague. <laughs> and Okay, but it's pretty specific in what he would describe. He, he says it's a pure river, right? No pollution there. If you've ever seen Lake Tahoe, uh, it's really, really clear uh, lake. And I remember looking down into the, the lake, and you could see like 20, 25 feet down. It's so clear in Lake Tahoe. But I just saw the other day some kind of a news report that they pulled 25,000 pounds of trash out of Lake Tahoe just recently. This place is not going to be like that. There's no pollution, no trash. It'll never dry up. And life is always flowing from it because it comes from the throne of God. F.B. Meyer, a Bible teacher from uh, a while back, he said, the river proves that the life of the blessed depends on the life of God. He's right. That's where life flows from, from God. The only way, I try to remember this as I go about my life, and maybe you could remember this too. The the only way that I can truly experience the life that I want is in my relationship with God. And that's why I have to press into Him. And that's why I urge you to all the time here as I teach the Bible. And so for eternity, His life is going to flow into us without any sort of barriers it's going to be great the things that you've longed for so much are going to become a reality the love you desire the hope that you want the purpose the fulfillment all those things god will provide that to you forever so great so we find those couple of things there well what else do we find there let's read on verse 2 says, in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Well, we know that every city has a main street and so does heaven, this new Jerusalem. There's a main street and there on the street we find the next important thing, right? What we're looking at the three things here that we find there and that is the tree of life that's the third answer to the first question the tree of life is there this isn't the first time that we've heard about the tree of life in the bible we've of course have been hearing about it in revelation but it's all the way back in the beginning of the bible too right in the garden of eden is the first place it appears the tree of life but there was a problem in the garden of eden because when adam and eve disobeyed god the lord blocked their way to the tree of life and so it was taken out of the equation for thousands of years but then we see here that in your new home the tree of life is going to be there again And it's my belief, and I've said this before, but that God is essentially putting things back to the way that he intended from the beginning. Only he's even going to do it better than he did before. And it looks like there's more than one tree of life this time, like lining that street. We have a couple of images here that is just artist's rendition of what it might be like. Could be that there's a whole main street in heaven full of trees of life where you can go and freely eat of them anytime you want it's awesome he wants you to have it notice there in verse 2 that they produce a different kind of fruit every month so not sure why he's doing that but that's what the lord wants to do and and it's going to be the most glorious taste you've ever experienced 
All the foodies are going to just love this part of it. (laughs) Delicious. We can rejoice. (laughs) Also, we're told there in verse 2 that the the leaves provide healing of some, some kind. That's kind of interesting that that would be there, isn't it? Do you think we get sick in heaven? No. We're going to see here in just a moment, you know, there's none of that anymore. We don't get hurt or sick. I'm not quite sure. You know, the original word used there for healing well, can mean therapy or to care for. So in some way, this is going to be therapeutic to our eternal health. Some, another way to say it is like perpetual health, maybe. But I'm not really sure. Nobody knows the answer to this. We'll find out when we get there. But these leaves, this tree, the fruit, somehow contribute to our enjoyment of the city. And God's got his reasons, and it's going to be a blessing. So those are some of the things that we find there in our new home. It's not everything. We saw a few things last week, too. And there'll be lots more revealed to you when you get there. Those are some things that you felt like we needed to know. Now, question number two in about our new home is, what do we do there? Okay, so that's what we're going to look at here for the next few minutes. What do we do there? So what do we find there? Now, what do we do there in this big question? So it says in verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall do what? Shall serve him. So let's talk about what won't be there first. <laughs> What did he just say that what won't be there? Any more curse, right? It's as if he's answering maybe a little bit of an objection that we have from verse 2. Because remember, we were wondering why we need healing. At least I was wondering that. <laughs> why do we need healing if we're in heaven? And there's, But he just said, it's not going to be because there's sin or a curse. Because those are gone. Right? There aren't any more of that. He's going to reverse the curse. <laughs> And so then that means, and we've learned this before, but i just like to, to reiterate it, that no one is ever going to die again. Nobody's going to get old. Nothing deteriorates. The Wycliffe Bible Commentary says, Life is everywhere. Death will never intrude again. Wow. <laughs> wow. So no more curse. And then John, as I said, begins telling us what we do there. And so the first answer, we've got three of these to the second question, right? Second question was, what do we do there? The first answer is, we shall serve him. It was just right there in verse 3. We shall serve him. Looks like you and I, friend, and I'm speaking to my Christian brothers and sisters, we're going to do some kind of work there, you know? The difference is, and this is so awesome, is, remember, there won't be any curse there, and so... It's a different kind of work than some of us are doing here today. It's sort of like when you ask your kids to go and do their chores. It's not that fun for the kids to go and fold laundry or empty the dishwasher. That's why we call them chores. (laughs) Well, this nothing there is going to be a chore. Nobody's going to get exhausted. Nobody's going to be mad. It'll be easy. It'll be natural. You'll love it. Remember, in the beginning, and I'm going back to when Adam and Eve were in the garden, that God wanted them, he put them in the garden, and he said, I want you to tend it and keep it, right? And so, those two, and and any others who would have been there, would have the responsibility of, I assume, like trimming it, and picking the fruit, and vegetables, and those were some of the ways that they could serve the Lord back then. Well... Just like that, he's going to have a job for you to do. Only it'll be something you love. Something that gives you a great sense of purpose and and you'll feel productive. And I think that you're going to be doing what you've always wanted to do. Maybe, just maybe, that we'll be continuing to develop the gifts that God has given us. Those supernatural gifts that you and I have. The things that you do and it really excites you because the Bible says that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So maybe those will just be more and more and more of that for eternity. Who knows? But I do know that you're going to love serving God. In other words, we're going to be eager to serve there. My grandson is three years old and sometimes (laughs) he helps us 
helps us <laughs> tear down the service here after we're done with service here at the school. And he is really eager to participate. Whatever job that I give him, he does it with all of his gusto for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and he likes to tell us all that he's doing it. Like, I'm helping. I help. See, I help. <laughs> you know, he tells us all that he's doing it. And so it'll kind of be like that, only with no pride <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> Just a privilege to serve God. So talking about what we do there, we serve him. There's another thing to do, we do in verse 4. Let's read that. It says, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Second answer to question 2 is we shall see him. So you'll serve him and you'll see him. I think that this might be like the biggest part of what we do. Just to be fascinated to be near God. I mean, we're going to see God in person. What is that even like? You know, you should be looking forward to that. If you're a believer, you should be looking forward to that. We're going to get to see the, I mean, aren't you interested in what God looks like? I am. We shouldn't be ashamed or nervous about that because he's forgiven you for your sins. You want to see him. You know, Job looked forward to it. I love this little section in Job 19. I wanted to show you. It's verses 26 and 27. He says, And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. <laughs> that guy is excited. And he's actually with the Lord now. It's like, what's he look like? I want to see him with my own eyes. And you're going to. You're going to. So we shall see him. Also, we learned something else there in verse 4 that I wanted to mention. It says that his name is on our forehead. You guys that like tattoos are going to love this part. <laughs> Boom. Permanent one right there for you. We can all see it. This isn't the first time this has come up in Revelation. Remember, previously we learned that in the Great Tribulation that the unbelievers had the name of the Antichrist put on their forehead or on the back of their right hand. It was called the Mark of the Beast. If you want to go back and look at that yourself, it's in chapter 13. That's when it's talked about. What that did is it indicated their allegiance to him, their worship of the beast or the devil himself. And so they would take that mark upon them. Now, also during the tribulation, the Christians received a mark on their forehead. And evidently, as we read there in verse 4, it's the name of the Lord that's on their forehead. And so that means when we arrive in glory, we're going to have that too. So how cool is that? I'm not sure when we get it. Could be as soon as we are resurrected. It could be when we get to the holy city. We don't know. But, but part of the resurrection is to identify you with your king in his name written on you. It's great. Verse 5 says, There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Is this like quickening your heart at all? I hope it is. <laughs> it should. He says that you don't have to turn on the light in the middle of the night so you don't stub your toe. Because there is no night. <laughs> it's always daytime. God is the light. Part of the purpose of night given to us humans is so that we could rest our bodies, you know, and our minds and sleep and recover for the day. Well, you're going to have a new body. That kind of rest isn't needed anymore. Instead, did you see in verse 5, it says, you will reign forever and ever. So what else will we do? The third answer now to question two, we're going through these together, is we shall be like him. Right? So we shall serve him, we shall see him, and we shall be like him. Um, we're told there, he reigns forever and ever, and so we will reign forever and ever with him. You know, the, the scriptures mention many times that you and I, in glory, will be like the Lord. Which is incredible if you think about it. Like me. I'm just some guy 
who was so messed up in his life that I was searching for answers and I was so disappointed with life and and I was destroying myself and God rescued me and now I'm going to get to be like him. What? Me? As I said, there's many passages that tell us this. I wanted to show you one just to get you a little more excited. It's in Psalm 17, 15. And look what David said. He says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. So that's pretty, that gives a lot of details there, doesn't it? Now, it's not that you and I will be like gods or be God like some religions teach. That's not what this means. But you could say, I think with very much confidence, that you will act more like him. You will love more like him. You will live forever with him. And as John just said there in verse 5, we will reign with him. (laughs) I have no idea what that even means. But I do know that it's going to fulfill all of your dreams. So then you could say back in verse 5 when it says, and they shall reign forever and ever. The they it's speaking of is the followers of Jesus Christ. And so I want to emphasize here for just a moment, if you believe, hope you're paying attention, if you believe, you are guaranteed this. Do we get that? You just haven't received it all yet. That's why it feels so strange sometimes. Think about it this way. Let's say that your parents were fabulously wealthy. They owned homes in all over the world, in the best places, mansions. They had yachts and a giant corporation. They could say to you, you know what, kid? One day, this is all going to be yours. They would be telling the truth, right? And that's entirely because of your status in that family. And on top of that, you'd experience many of the benefits of it now, even though you haven't fully received all of that yet well it's similar for believers you will reign with him because you are his child you see that determination has already been made in this life but the full benefit package (laughs) comes in the next life it's an exclusive membership you guys it's a family and you can only just like well let's take our our world here you can only enter a family here in this world in one of two ways. You either are born into it or adopted into it. And we have people right here in this room that's experienced both of those, right? Being born into a family or adopted into a family. Well, we actually have both of those in God's family. You become his child by being born again by faith. And then he adopts you in by his grace. (laughs) So awesome. So then, because of that, you're going to have access to all of his benefits. Those are some of the things that you're going to do in your new home. Hope you're looking forward to that. Well, there's one more big question to answer here, and that is, when do we move in? (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) We're ready. Well, not so fast. Let's read on. Um, Verse 6 says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. So this angel has been showing all uh, that's going to take place to John. And now he says everything that he has said is faithful and true. You might want to underline that if you do that in your Bible or highlight it. It must be, maybe the look on John's face was just like, he's having a hard time with this. It's like, maybe you might be having a hard time with this. Because it seems too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, the angel just reminded us that God is telling you the truth. And so we need to listen up and believe it. Because, you know, life is kind of humdrum sometimes. Going to school or commuting to work, cleaning out the garage. You can kind of, as a believer, kind of forget about this reality of who you actually are here on this planet. But he's saying, you can believe this. You can put your entire trust in it. He's given us this reassurance because long ago, there was a fallen angel named Lucifer. And he lied 
to the first woman named Eve. And she probably thought, because there's this angelic being that's from God, telling her something, that it must be true. And of course, we know that he was deceiving her. It was all a lie. He was trying to get her to rebel against God, and she did. She fell for it. And so this angel now testifies that God sent him to tell us all these things that we can expect. And we're supposed to believe it. So what he says then is start talking about when we move in. And what did he say there at the end of verse 6? He said, shortly. So that's the first answer to question 3, is we move in shortly. Uh, You could think of it this way. It was soon when he said it back then, so it's really soon now. Not yet, obviously, but it's really soon. He said he's telling the truth. So what does that mean? Well, it could be short compared to eternity or short in the history of the world, that kind of thing, in a comparison sort of thing. But the the angel just said it's going to happen shortly. There's another one. Look in verse 7. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. This is the Lord himself speaking. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So the second answer to the the question is quickly. So when do we move in? He said shortly and quickly. Well, based on these answers, it sounds like it could be any time, doesn't it? But you might be sitting here thinking, well, but this was written 2,000 years ago. It doesn't seem very quick to me. The Bible plans ahead for when we question things. Apostle Peter talked about this in Second Peter 3, 8. And I want to show you that. He said, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. That's another way of him kindly saying, just be patient, be patient, because he only wrote this two days ago. So it hasn't been that long. Quickly, shortly, suddenly, God has chosen to wait. Peter said in that passage, that he doesn't want anybody to perish, but that all who would will have eternal life. So he waited for you. He waited for me. My pastor, Chuck Smith, when I first got saved, he used to say, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't come back in the 70s? Right? Because I'd have missed it. God's chosen to wait. He wants all to be saved. But know this, the coming of Jesus for you is near. Whether it's the end of our life, or the rapture of the church, our days are numbered. And so we got to be ready to meet him. And so John, quoting the Lord there in verse 7, says, Blessed is he who keeps the word. So this is what we do in the meantime. We keep the words, right? Blessed, that word, another way of saying that is, oh, how happy. Oh, how happy. So uh, in other words, there's a built-in blessing for you who trust in God's word. People are blessed by God who keep his word. So what that means is when my behavior doesn't line up with God's clear teaching on it, then I'm faced with changing my behavior to match his expectations. And unless I do, I won't experience the way he wants to bless me. So practically what that means is be careful about letting other people convince you that the word doesn't matter or that it isn't true or... You can add to it or take things away because that's a lot of that's going on in our culture right now. It's kind of like in our books that we have today, in all the books that are written, when you open it, that first page has a copyright warning on there. And it says something like, no part of this book may be reproduced or used in any form without written permission from the publisher. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why they put that in there. But one of the reasons is they don't want their words to be misused. Because any of those words are part of the whole, right? And it's the same with the Bible. So you can't remove any of it. You can't explain it away. And those kind of things. And so he said there, the Lord himself said, blessed are those who keep it. I heard somebody say once that the Bible shows you the way of the path of life and then it shows you when you're going off the path and then it shows you how to get back on the path and finally it shows you how to stay on the path and that's so glorious and that's why we need to pay attention and do what the Lord says Dwight Moody said that the scriptures are not here just for you to know more 
It's to change your life. That's when we're blessed. (laughs) When God, by His Spirit, through His Word, is changing our life. And I assume that's what you want. That's why you're here. Praise God for that. Well, to end our time here, the last thing we're going to look at, number four, is a caution. There's a caution here at the end of the section we're covering. And the caution is this. Don't misplace your worship. Okay? So let's see what that's about. Verse 8 and 9. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Can you turn to the person sitting next to you and say, Worship God. (laughs) Worship God. Worship God. That's a good word right there. It's a good reminder because some people want to take worship for themselves. Uh, There was this news reporter uh, a while back that got into hot water because he made up a couple of comments where he was, he said he was present in some major news stories, but it turns out he wasn't. So then the internet starts to take off and photoshopping him into things like he's with Lincoln at Gettysburg and things like that. Or like this meme here, he's storming Normandy with the beach there and he of course wasn't alive then and those kind of things. So it's pretty awkward, right? He wanted so badly to be relevant that he made this stuff up. But John doesn't have to do that because he actually was an eyewitness. And you know what? To show you he's just a guy like us, he even records that he responded wrongly. If somebody was making this up, they would make themselves out to be the hero. Well, he shows that in his excitement, he bows down to an angel, which is wrong. (laughs) And the angel corrects him, right? I mean, give the guy a break because if we saw an angel in their angelic form, we would probably do the same thing. Because people do that in the Bible. You know, it's just like overwhelming. You think it's God, right? But the angel just says, look, man, I'm just a servant like you. Don't worship me. (laughs) We're just created beings, just like you. Trust in the Lord, right? It's a good word. And again, this helps us offset what's happened previously in the history of the world because Satan was an angel. And he wanted to be worshipped so much that he gave up. It seems like he gave up being the worship leader in heaven Because he wanted the adoration of people. And then he gets people today to like sell their soul for that kind of stuff. So there's a caution here. The caution is don't misplace your worship. (laughs) Only God deserves it. I wanted to mention here that it's interesting to me that many false religions were started with visions of angels. The Mormon religion was started with the vision of an angel. So is Jehovah's Witnesses. Islam began with angelic message, visions. The New Age stuff. You see, what happened is in each one of those examples is the things they declare contradict the scriptures. (laughs) They've got a new thing that they want to tell people, right? So here's the warning, the caution. (laughs) If someone tries to convince you like that, just know that the Bible warns us about it, that we're not to accept that. And I want to show you one of the best verses in the Bible about it. It's in Galatians 1.8. It says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So that's pretty plain, right? <laughs> any other gospel, any other truth, right? Don't listen to it. False. <laughs> now, you might be listening to this, watching online, hearing on the radio, here today thinking, but then why should we listen to this angel then? Well, I would say that the answer to that is for one reason and one reason only. And that is because he does not contradict the word of God. That's why you listen to him. That's why you need to know the word of God. True angels, a a true preacher, will only reinforce the message of God. (laughs) And so that's the message here, isn't it? Worship God, (laughs) not anybody else. Verse 10 says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. All right. Well, Daniel was told to seal up his book. 
because the time it wasn't ready yet for what he was sharing it it had to be revealed later right and we have it now of course and but this one revelation is to be open immediately because he said the time is near actually the word revelation we saw it in verse one of the book that it means uncovering or unveiling so god wants his plan revealed to us it's a good reminder that we don't like keep it from being shared that we got to actually tell someone about this because he's coming quickly right the time is near amen well let's finish verse 11 and it says and he who is unjust let him be unjust still he who is filthy let him be filthy still he who is righteous let him be righteous still and he who is holy let him be holy still all right even though the next part that I'm going to cover next week is going to urge all people to come to Christ one more time in the Bible. (laughs) There's a sad reality that some people never will. They can be convinced no matter what you say or what you do. So then what we're being told here pretty plainly is they're going to remain in that state forever. And it seems like from the scriptures that it gets worse and worse. But the righteous, the holy ones... The forgiven ones. We're going to continue in the other direction, aren't we? It's going to be glorious. So what's our takeaway here about our new home? Warren Wearsby said, Heaven is more than a destination. It's a motivation. <laughs> that is, we, it ought to change the way that we live now. It ought to change my priorities. It ought to change our attitude, our faithfulness, our sense of urgency. I mean, think about if you were John. And you got your own private showing of this future home. What would that have done? What would that do to you? I mean, this seems like it made a huge difference in his life. And it would make a huge difference in your life. And this is the way God has chosen to reveal this to you in his word. Our rest of our days ought to be remembering what lies before us. And that we would be blessed. (laughs) Amen. God bless you guys. I want to give you a quick question for the car ride home for just to kind of think over, chew on. The question is, are you living with your new home in mind? Hope so. Maybe you needed some encouragement. You're going through hard stuff. Maybe there's a health thing going on in your life. Uh, You know, you have a family difficulty. You lost your job. You're broke. Whatever the thing is, God is here to help you. And he wants you He will help you, but he also wants you living with the future in mind. So I pray that that will bless you, my friend. And lastly, as I just turn this over to Lisa and the worship team, I just want to invite you, if you're not a Christian yet, that you would put your trust in Christ before you leave today. I don't know if you have faith in Christ. I pray that you would. The rest of us do. And and someone invited me once, and, and you can be a Christian today. You can know that you have eternal life and that heaven is going to be your new home. But you have to go to him by faith. And I just pray that you would, that you would say something, even during this song, just open up your heart and say, God, please come into my, my life. Forgive me for my sins. I know that this is true. I know that you love me. I know that you sent your son to die for my sins. Please receive me. Please forgive me. Thank you for loving me. And he will forgive you. Because God loves to save sinners like you and me. So God bless you guys. Let's worship him together and then we'll close our service, okay?